Good morning everyone and welcome to your webinar, The 5 Things SMEs Get Wrong in Payroll. Small businesses are disproportionately represented, represented, sorry, represented in fair work investigations and fines. They have to comply with all the same legislation and regulations of larger employers, but don't often have the in-house knowledge of payroll or resources required to respond to payroll issues. Small businesses are just as likely to overpay than underpay, so payroll errors are either costing you money or putting you at risk of compliance fines. In this webinar session, Tracy will go through five things that small businesses often get wrong in relation to payroll. My name is Vicky and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd just like to run through some housekeeping information. Today's session will run for approximately 45 minutes with 50 minutes of questions. Questions can be submitted at any time in the question box on the webinar's control panel. We will not be using microphones today for the session. Our presenter today is Tracy Angwin. Tracy is a corporate escapee with an obsession for improving payroll compliance and efficiency. She is the Managing Director of Australian Payroll Association, which provides advisory services and training to the payroll sector. In 2013, she recently published her first book, The Payroll Revolution. Well respected by payroll suppliers and employers alike, Tracy often speaks at payroll conferences and events. She is regularly quoted in national and international media. I will now hand you over to Tracy to continue our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicky, for that introduction. I think it's a bit, uh, it's a bit sad, really, when I'm described as having an obsession with payroll compliance. Uh, um, I honestly am uh, vaguely more interesting than that, and I'll try and, uh, try and help you uh, with to, to get some interesting payroll facts today. So thank you, Vicky, and thank you to uh, the team at Reckon, and good morning, everyone. Um, the, the great thing about and then being invited to uh, present these topics to you today and to partner with Reckon is that, that payroll, vendor, you know, payroll vendors such as Reckon understand that payroll is complex, so I'm uh, very pleased to be able to support this initiative to support their clients and your payroll function. Australian Payroll Association helps our clients to ensure they've got a compliant and low risk and efficient payroll operation because there's many, many risks associated with payroll. But there's also a great opportunity in terms of getting it right as very few organisations actually use the intelligence that comes from payroll to assist in running their business. And I think that that's something that um, you know, is, is really underestimated in, in business today. So over the past uh, 20 years now, more than 20 years I've been in the payroll industry, I've seen a lot of great payroll operations and quite a few not so great ones. Um, I've been involved in improving payroll processes for hundreds of companies. I've assisted in developing payroll technology. I've worked with uh, organisations to ensure they've got the right payroll people on board with the appropriate payroll skills and knowledge. I've uh, fortunately or unfortunately been involved in uh, payroll fraud investigations. I've worked for a global organisation that had to deal with the largest uh, payroll disaster recovery project in history. Um, I've also ha though had the pleasure of working with many forward-thinking payroll professionals and, and also business owners and managers to make payroll the least hassle possible and to deliver the, the lowest amount of risk and provide the greatest benefit to business. Oops, sorry about that, just got a bit of a technical issue here. So, uh, sorry about that. Um, so in 2013, as Vicky said, I decided to put uh, much of this experience into a book called The Payroll Revolution. So um, you know, that, that really is uh, an, a collective uh, opinion of, of 20 years, as I say, being in the payroll industry and uh, very much focused on identifying and leveraging the value out of your payroll operation. So when would you notice payroll? I said to Vicky just before we, we went uh, live that I always like to make sure I've got photos or at least one photo of a firefighter in every slide deck. So um, if you come to the rest of the webinars, we think we've got a series of six, you'll be pleased to know that there'll be firefighters in every upcoming webinar. But unfortunately, we normally notice payroll when there's a problem. And if that problem is big enough, it often gets in the mainstream press. So you don't have to go too far to find people who associate the words payroll problem with organisations such as Queensland Health or more recently the New Zealand uh, Ministry of Transport or a few years ago the Department of Defence. But smaller organisations are also affected. So 
if you actually have a look on the Fair Work website, you'll notice that ma the majority of organisations who are fined for not paying their employees correctly are actually small and medium-sized uh, organisations. Now, this isn't because large organisations don't make mistakes. It's more that they tend to sort out their industrial problems on the steps of the court rather than um, going through the court process and, like I say, eventually ending up in, in, the, uh, in the press. But fundamentally, the issue is, as Vicky alluded to before, is that small and medium organisations have exactly the same industrial laws to deal with as large organisations. The problem is, of course, is that as small and medium organisations, we don't have the same access to legal and, and other resources. So these, these organisations tend to be the ones that are caught and are fined. So we work with, with many uh, SMEs as well as some of Australia's largest employers. And we've certainly seen some similarities in the things that SMEs are getting wrong in payroll. Now I've chosen five things today to talk about um, because of purely of time constraints, but really it was a there's really a list of probably up to a hundred of things that SMEs regularly get wrong. But I'm going to give you a bit of a variety uh, today, and, and, and this is certainly no, by no means an exhaustive list. Um, I've kept away some of the biggest mistakes around termination for a, a future webinar that we're doing on terminations, but like I say, I could probably uh, list a good hundred issues, um, but let's have a look at them, some of the most common. The first one, um, is incorrectly paying superannuation. And this is a problem for a few reasons. First of all, you often don't know that you're paying incorrectly uh, superannuation payments because employees, particularly younger ones who don't even think of superannuation as being currency, um, they're not exactly sure what they should be paid either. They also don't, they're less likely to check their superannuation payments and feed that back to you. But the issue here is if you're audited by the tax office, there are pretty big fines, um, $2,000 per breach for getting it wrong. So if you are underpaying, there's also interest uh, that you'd need to pay and also the super guarantee charge to deal with. So it's a pretty expensive mistake to make. And of course, if you overpay superannuation, that's expensive too. So what is superannuation? It's 9.5% of gross payments, right? It's actually not, and this is the first common uh, misconception that a lot of uh, small businesses that we work with um, don't realise. It, it's super is not nine and a half percent of gross payments. So many employees, in, uh, many employers, I beg your pardon, end up overpaying super. There are quarterly maximum uh, superannuation contribution caps that kick in for your high income earners. There's also age limits, at which point you don't have to pay super. And it's also worth noting that super is not payable until an employee earns more than $450 a month. But what super really is, is 9.5% of ordinary time earnings. So ordinary time earnings, as it says on the screen here, are, ordinary, uh, are generally what employees earn for their ordinary hours of work, what they would normally be paid for their normal work. So once you've determined what your ordinary time earnings are, that's what you should be paying super on and ordinary time earnings only. So how do you figure out ordinary time earnings? Well, this is a, um, and you'll, you'll all be getting a, a, a copy of, of the slide deck, so um, you won't need to write this down. I've kind of squished it in as well to get it on one page. But if you go through this OTE decision tree, you can determine whether a payment that you're making is ordinary time earnings. So let's take normal time, for example. If we top, start at the top, is it a payment or allowance? Yes, it's a payment. Does it relate to overtime? No, it doesn't. Is it, does it relate to a termination? If it's just normal time for payment, you know, if it's just, no one's terminating, no, it doesn't. Does it relate to leave? No, it doesn't. Is it related to leave loading? No, it doesn't. Is it related to workers' comp? No, it doesn't. So therefore, you get down to that green box at the end, which says normal time is ordinary time earnings. Another example might be uh, leave loading. So we say, is it a payment or an allowance? Um, so we say it's a, it's a, um, a payment. Is it related to overtime? Uh, no, it's not. Is it related to termination? No, it's not. Is it related to leave? Yes, it is. Is it related to leave loading? Well, yes, it is. And so leave loading is not ordinary time earning. So you shouldn't be paying superannuation on leave loading. Um, another example, just going through a few examples that you, you might have, uh, Saturday penalty loading, for example. Um, 
that's not related to um, overtime because it's a Saturday penalty, not related to termination or leave or leave loading or workers' comp. So that's ordinary time earnings. Overtime is one that uh, employers often get wrong. So overtime, if you have a look here, at right at the top, is it a payment or allowance? It's a payment. Is it related to overtime? Yes, it's not ordinary time earnings. So you don't pay superannuation on overtime. So have a look. Um, if you have a look at that, that slide, you'll see down at the bottom, related to workers' comp, there's a little asterisk there. There's always an asterisk in payroll. There's always a rule and there's plenty of exceptions to those rules and that's what makes payroll so complicated. So the ordinary time earnings legislation says that workers' comp is not ordinary time earnings and therefore not superable. However, what you need to do in payroll always is always check not only the, um, the Fair Work legislation and ATO legislation, but you also need to check your, your modern award or your industrial agreement. And what you'll find is that most modern awards that pay, um, say that paid leave including work-related injury or illness where the employee is receiving regular payments from the employer attracts super. So whilst the ordinary time earnings says workers' comp's not superable, your modern award most likely says it is. And normally there's a time limit to that, so it's typically 52 weeks. So the answer to the question is, does, do you pay superannuation on workers' compensation payments is sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. It depends on the industrial instrument that you are working under. So make sure you, you check that when you've got a workers' comp payment. So have, let's have a look at other things, of, um, other areas, what is ordinary time earnings and what is not. So ordinary time earnings down the left hand side, these are things that you will always pay superannuation on. So you'll always pay it on normal hours. You'll always pay it on shift loading because that is the ordinary, shift loading is, is uh, paid for normal ordinary hours worked. It just so happens they, those normal ordinary hours attract a shift loading. It's paid on leave payments when you take leave and it's also paid on all allowances that have unconditional payments. So things like, um, things like that, that are paid unconditionally like a first aid certificate, you're going to get it where you know, it, it's paid unconditionally. It's also paid on payments in lieu of notice which a lot of organisations get wrong and another thing that um, a lot of small and large businesses get wrong is superannuation is payable on bonuses and commissions. Um, a lot of organisations don't realise that's the case. Now what's excluded from, from ordinary time earnings? Certainly re expense reimbursements, um, that's, that's fairly obvious, but overtime is something that's excluded. So again, a lot of employers are overpaying super because they're paying it on overtime. Excluded also from uh, ordinary time earnings is leave payments on termination and that's because you're not actually taking the leave. You're, it's not ordinary time earnings because they're not actually working. Also excluded are allowances that are fully expended or with, that we expect to be fully expended like um, a travel allowance for example. And annual leave loading is also not ordinary time earnings. So that's, um, that's OTE and the, the, the first uh, thing that we see a lot of organisations getting a little tied up in knots about. And the second thing I wanted to talk about is casual penalty rates. We get a lot of questions from employers asking how exactly do that, should they calculate casual penalty rates. So there are, the problem is, is there's different ways to calculate casual penalty rates for casual employees. So I want to go through the three most common methods to do this. Under most modern awards, when a casual employee gets a penalty rate, both the casual loading and the penalty rates are calculated on the, base, uh, on the base rate of pay. So you do need to refer to your award or industrial agreement to, uh, to, to, be, to see how your casual uh, penalty rates work. But this is what we call the default method. And the default method is that you have the base rate, the base hourly rate, plus the casual loading, which is a, a percentage of the base rate, plus the base rate time, times the penalty. So the example here is if you're a food and beverage attendant grade one, so a lot of anyone who's running cafes and, and restaurants will, will uh, understand this, got a base rate of 17.35 and if they work on a Sunday, they'll get a 25% casual loading for being casual plus a 50% penalty for Sunday work 
and both of those are, are, are calculated on the base rate of $17.35. So you see the calculation at the bottom is you've got your base $17.35, you've got your $17.35 by 25%, which is your casual loading, your $17.35 by 50%, which is your penalty for Sunday, gives um, a food and beverage attendant grade one working on a Sunday $30.37 per hour. There's a second one which they call Code A, um, which is called the all-purpose approach. Now, some awards will specifically say that the casual loading is all-purpose, and this is what it's referring to. If your award has an all-purpose casual loading, any penalty rate should be, should be paid on top of the casual rate, not on the base rate. So, for example, it's the base rate including the ca and times the casual loading and then multiplied by the penalty. So an example is a casual maintenance and horticulture employee working on a public holiday. So they have a 25% all-purpose casual loading and a public holiday penalty of double time and a half. So the $18.02, which is the base rate, we add the casual uh, loading to that and then the, the sum of that loaded rate we times by 250% to get double time and a half so we get an hourly rate of $56.31 for casual maintenance uh, and horticulture employees working on a public holiday. And the sum awards, um, penalty rates are paid instead of casual loading. So in these cases where a, pe where a penalty rate applies, casuals don't get their usual casual loading if the penalty is greater than the casual loading. And again, post fair work we're always looking at what is the what is the most uh, generous um, allowance and that's what we should always be paying so in this example of a casual employee in the hair and beauty industry it's just the base rate plus the penalty so if you're a hairdresser in level 6 Monday to Friday you get a standard 25% casual loading if you're a casual employee on Saturdays there's a 33% penalty rate so because the 33% penalty rate is greater than the 25% casual loading, we pay the penalty rate only. So the base rate of 21.33 on a Saturday, we add 33% to get a Saturday rate for a casual uh, hair and beauty industry employee of $28.37. So I hope that all makes sense. Um, the next area that is can be quite confusing is issues around, particularly around superannuation and taxation of allowances. So in terms of defining allowances, they are separately identified payments and there's different reasons that you'd pay allowances to employees. There's, um, you, you might pay for working conditions, so if you're running a construction site you might pay danger money, you might pay uh, height money which would may change depending on what level of a, of a building that, that's being built, so they get different height money for different levels. You might pay dirt money. Um, there's all sorts of other uh, allowances that are based on working conditions. You also might pay allowances based on qualifications or special duties. So for example, if you have got a first aid certificate or you're a safety officer, you might get some sort of first aid allowance as an employee. There's also non-deductible employee expenses and work-related uh, employee expenses which are tax deductible. So these are typically travel allowances um, and car allowances. Some are work related, some are not, so they, they are treated differently for taxation purposes. So in terms of a car allowance, it doesn't actually matter often. I mean, it depends on what you use the car for as to how it's uh, treated and whether it's accessible, accessible income. But it is most are always uh, subject to PAYG. Now allowances are paid regardless whether the employee incurs the expense or not. So if you've got a travel allowance, um, whether or not the employee incurs the expense, that can be a fixed allowance and based on those conditions will determine how it's taxed. So what are your superannuation guarantee obligations when paying allowances? Most allowances are included in ordinary time earnings. Um, expense allowances and reimbursements are obviously not salary and wages, so therefore they're not uh, ordinary time earnings. Um, 
and expense allowances that where there's a reasonable expectation that it will be fully expended. So uh, they are included, I beg your pardon, in, in uh, ordinary time earnings. Excluded would be a, a good example of excluded uh, from ordinary time earnings is on call allowances when the employee is not working. Because remember, ordinary time earnings is related to when you ordinarily work. So if you're on call, you're a nurse and you're on call overnight, um, if you don't get called in and you get an on-call allowance for being on call, you don't get superannuation paid on that because it's excluded from ordinary time earnings because you didn't work. However, if you have an on-call loading, so you're on call and then you do get called in and you get a loading for those, those hours because you work, it is included in ordinary time earnings. So just a couple of, of course, exceptions to these rules. Allowances that are fully expended, such as travel, uh, they're generally paid after tax and no super is applied. But if you've got people that do travel and get travel allowances, make sure you check your geographic limits. There are geographic limits. So if I travel between Sydney and Brisbane, that's a different allowance cap than if I travel from Sydney to Broome. So you need to, you need to check those things. Um, likewise, a car allowance paid to a sales rep that you expect to be fully expended is, is the same. As compared to a car allowance that's paid to, say, an executive who doesn't leave the office, they don't necessarily incur any work-related car expenses. They have their, their car allowance taxed as normal income and super is paid as it's an unconditional allowance. And when that person terminates, you'll also need to pay that allowance as part of their termination pay. So just to um, summarise uh, those things, for every allowance type you have, we look at whether you withhold um, PAYG, uh, is it on the payment summary and if, if so, where, and does uh, super guarantee apply? So in terms of the, those are the first allowances we're talking about, you've got your, um, your crib, your danger, your dirt, your height, your site, your shift allowance, your travelling time, your trade allowances, your first aid allowances, um, yes, we withhold uh, PAYG on those payments. Yes, they are included in the payment summary in the gross payment box. And yes, we apply superannuation to those payments. Allowances paid for non-deductible expenses. So these are things like um, part day travel where there's been no overnight absence from their place of residence, uh, meal allowance and motor vehicles for non-deductible travel. So we still would uh, withhold PAYG. We would still put these allowances on the payment summary in the gross payment field and pay superannuation on all these allowances. And allowances paid for um, expected deductible expenses. So where you pay an allowance and you expect there would be um, an expense incurred. So things like tool money for, you know, uh, Again, construction industry, apprentices, um, you've got compulsory uniform or dry cleaning, uh, you've got motor vehicle for work-related travel. Yes, we withhold. Um, yes, it's on the payment summary, but it's in a separate allowance box with an explanation, and superannuation does not apply to these allowances. And here's the on-call allowance example, just on the, a single page, just showing that outside of ordinary hours, so if I'm just uh, on call but I don't get called in, I haven't worked, superannuation doesn't apply to that payment. Now, one other thing to know about allowances is that um, there are some allowances that are subject to varied rates of withholding. So these are often kilometres, deductible clothing, uh, meal allowances, travel, uh, where there's been an overnight absence from the employee's place of residence. Uh, I could actually talk an hour on these, so we'll leave this one for another day. But if you do have these allowances, please get advice as to the taxation and super treatment of them based on your specific circumstances, because there's not a, a one-size-fits-all solution to these uh, allowances. So we've got a webinar coming up. I think it's the or sixth webinar in the series where we're going to go through in quite a lot of detail terminations and the things that employers uh, trip up on on terminations. But one thing that I wanted to go through on this first webinar to give you a little bit of a taste is what is an employment termination payment? I'm not going to go through any of the taxation of, of ETPs today, but I just want to 
uh, a lot of a lot of employers don't understand when an ETP, uh, when a termination payment is an ETP and when it's not. So, uh, an, an ETP is an employment termination payment that's in consequence of the termination of the employment and is received no later than 12 months after the termination occurs. So that just means that if it wasn't for the employee terminating, the payment wouldn't be made to the taxpayer. So um, that's how you determine what is an ETP and what isn't. So some of the payments that are ETPs um, include gratuities, golden handshakes, saying thanks very much, you've had a great 20 years, here's, a, here's some, some pay. Uh, additional pay, severance pay, so anything that's to do with um, with severance, that's more along the lines of, um, look, it's not working out for either of us, here's a, here's a severance pay and um, we'll accept your resignation. Um, any non-genuine redundancy payments, any payments in lieu of notice, so when um, you actually have a, a, a termination or a resignation and you don't want that person uh, to work out their notice, you make a payment in lieu of notice, so that's an ETP. Any unused RDOs on termination or unused sick leave if you, if you pay it. Some, organ, some uh, industries do pay out sick leave on termination. Any compensation for wrongful dismissal. Um, that's when uh, someone takes you to court for unfair dismissal. They get a judgment made in their favour. You have to pay them an amount. That, that then becomes an ETP. Obviously anything in respect of genuine redundancy, uh, invalidity and um, ill health payments, of course there's another asterisk other than personal injury payments, and any lump sum payments, any death benefit payments um, if you're in the unfortunate accident of having uh, one of your employees pass away while they work for you is an ETP. So what's not an ETP? And this is typically where employers get it wrong. Payments that are not ETPs include, uh, include all accrued leave at the time of termination for annual leave for leave loading and for long service leave. So leave loading, and we'll go into this more on the, in the termination webinar, but leave loading is an interesting one. Um, it's often you would read a, a, a modern award and leave loading on termination is often silent. So you would make the assumption that leave loading is not paid on termination. However, there's a little known clause in the Fair Work Act that says if an employee gets leave loading when they take leave, they are entitled to the same loading on the accrued leave at termination. So the concept of fair work, working with the national employment standards, working with the modern awards or your industrial instrument, is that you always have to pay the most generous or you have to provide for the most generous payments or the uh, most generous circumstances for your employees. So even though leave loading is silent in the modern award, doesn't mean you don't have to pay it on termination because it's overridden by the Fair Work Act. Slightly going off topic there, but I just thought that was a useful thing to know because many, many employers get this wrong and if an employee complains they haven't got their leave loading on termination, they make a call to Fair Work, uh, you'll get investigated and it's not fun from there on in. Um, okay, so other things that are not ETPs, uh, obviously salary, wages, allowances, bonuses, incentive for work already undertaken. Um, any payments below the genuine redundancy uh, or early retirement tax-free limit. So these are changing every year, so make sure you, uh, when you're doing calculations, make sure you're using the current um, tax-free limits. And they are also based on how long the employees worked for you. Any foreign termination payments, any super benefits and any employee share scheme payments, not ETPs. So that takes me on to the fifth issue, which I did touch on with the leave loading example, is that the combination of national employment standards, which is the ten things that you have to, every employee needs to, um, to have a provision for in their employment with you, the Fair Work Act and your industrial instruments, whether they be modern awards or EBAs or whatever instruments that you're using. You always have to look for the most generous provision and sometimes that can be quite difficult because you've got two or three or more places you've got to check to see what the correct payment is for your employee. You can't always get the answer from a single source. 
Um, and one thing that small business we see all the time, and it please, please, please don't do this. Fair work, really jump on this very, very hard. Is that you can't pay more on an hourly rate and opt out of your obli other obligations. For example, the most common thing that small business uh, would do in this situation is say, look to employees, look, we'll pay a higher rate of pay for every hour that you work, but we're not going to pay penalty rates. So if the award says the base rate's eighteen dollars and you agree with your employee to pay a flat rate of twenty five no matter when they work, therefore ignoring any overtime or weekend penalties, you're breaking the law, you will be fined. Um, if you if you if you're caught or you're um, you're audited by Fair Work or if one of your employees complains. Now there's all sorts, I mean the Fair Work website and certainly our website is absolutely littered with articles about em employers that have got this one wrong. Uh, it is the one that will make the most financial damage to you. There is an organisation, uh, a small fruit and veggie shop that were employing four people incorrectly a couple of years ago. They were actually employing them as contractors, not as employees and they were fined $166,000 for that. Now that's an awful lot of fruit and veggie sales to make up that, you know, that, that business clearly couldn't continue. Um, other examples are last year there was a Newcastle based um, transport company that used to do airport transfers from Sydney Airport to Newcastle. They paid their driver or their drivers based on uh, like a piecemeal rate for how, just per trip. Um, it, they, they thought they were generously compensating their drivers, but when they worked it down to an hourly rate, they were actually underpaying. That, that company got a significant fine from Fair Work. And the problem with Fair Work is these Fair Work, ATO, state revenue officers, they all talk now. So if you've understated wages at all for uh, any of these purposes, you can expect to, after you've had a fair work audit, you've got a fair chance of getting a superannuation audit. If you understate your wages for superannuation, you've got a fair chance of getting a payroll tax audit. So it's just, you know, as we all know, a complete waste of time, energy, resources, sanity, all the rest of it to, to be getting these audits. Um, all of those organisations and government departments uh, will fine you. Uh, and it's it's really is it not only time consuming but extremely expensive if you get it wrong. So uh, please please don't do that. If you want to have some sort of creative way to pay your employees, um, please get advice on uh, on how you might do that before you uh, go and do that. So in e examples of. Uh, of things you might want to look for. We talked about workers' compensation not being ordinary time earnings. That's the legislation. It says that in black and white. However, most modern awards say that super is payable on workers' compensation for 52 weeks. So in this case, we're always looking for the most generous provision. Therefore, source B uh, trumps, if you like, source A, and you pay superannuation on workers' compensation for 52 weeks generally. Uh, likewise, here's the, the other example I talked about where most awards are silent on leave loading. The assumption is, and you know, you, you, most people wouldn't be thought poorly of reading an award saying, well, it's silent, so obviously you don't have to pay it. However, the Fair Work Act says that if the employee is entitled to leave loading when they take leave, they will be paid it also on termination as if the leave were worked. So there's really hundreds of these examples and we recommend that if you don't understand how your industrial agreements work with uh, the National Employment Standards and Fair Work, that you get advice based on your specific circumstances. So how can we, I've told you all the scary things about payroll and look we haven't had, <laughs> it, it's, you know, payroll is, is quite um, frustratingly complicated in this country. Um, I don't think that we could do much more to make it much harder. Um, we've got, particularly if you're running a national payroll or at least even a payroll over more than one state, uh, it's very, very frustrating because some things are governed federally like um, annual leave and uh, personal leave. 
and modern awards and some things are governed at a state level like payroll tax and like uh, long service leave. And then of course you've got the changes and retrospective changes. It's very complicated. So how do we do risk that? The first thing you've got to do, and this is the difference between SMEs and larger organisations, is that larger organisations typically have access to, to payroll expertise through their payroll managers. Uh, that's not necessarily always the case. Like I say, it's, I'm not saying they don't make mistakes. They certainly do. Um, but you need to try and find, as a small business or a medium-sized business, uh, access to genuine payroll expertise. So that might, might well be, you might be large enough to have a qualified payroll person on your team. There are, it's only about two and a half years old, but you can do a certificate for in payroll administration. That is the benchmark for Australian uh, payroll qualifications in Australia, or if you've got a larger organisation and you want your payroll manager to do a diploma of payroll management, that can be done as well. Uh, rather self-serving, I might add, you could join a payroll support organisation such as Australian Payroll Association. There are three or four organisations that you could join um, and just get access to you know, those organisations' resources, their help desk, just for the amount of money that you pay, which is not much, our organisation is about $2 a day, um, just to have access to those resources to make sure you're not getting these things wrong. And also to make sure you're not overpaying uh, things like super is, is really is quite priceless. Um, I've got, look at outsourcing your payroll, another asterisk, I just need to point out that outsourcing your payroll doesn't necessarily outsource the responsibility for your payroll. So whilst I think outsourcing your payroll from a small business perspective is actually a really uh, very sensible idea in a lot of cases, and it will certainly, if you do the numbers and how much it's costing you to um, do your payroll, it can be a, a significant cost reduction. However, if you outsource your payroll, remember you're not outsourcing the responsibility. So the very first thing you've got to do if you outsource your payroll is make sure the people that are doing your payroll are qualified. Do they have a cert for in payroll administration? Do they have a diploma of payroll management? Outside of that, they are not qualified. The other thing to ask as well is, are they able to provide advisory services or are you purely just outsourcing the labour? So you really want an outsourcing organisation that can provide advisory services because they will just pay what you tell them to pay unless they're providing advisory services. So if you are overpaying or if you are doing things incorrectly, um, you know, you, you want to be told of that. Oh, well, someone's, someone's uh, gone off mute. Just... Sorry about that. Someone just went off mute. I've just muted uh, someone at Reckon. I apologise for that. I'll <laughs> unmute you when we're finished. Um, and the other thing, really, really importantly, and I'm sure we've got some uh, bookkeepers and accountants on, on the webinar, is outsourcing payroll, organisations outsourcing payroll are actually providing a BAS service, so they must have a tax agent or BAS agent registration with the Tax Practitioners Board. If they do not, it puts their, their clients, you, at risk because if they get the payroll wrong and say that you're, uh, you've underpaid your PAYG or super, um, you do not get the ATO safe harbour provisions. If, you're, if your payroll outsourcer is registered, you will get those safe harbour provisions. So really, really important. And last, I did a survey last year and I found out that 16, one six uh, percentage of payroll outsourcers that I surveyed had that registration. So the majority don't have it. Make sure they have it. Another way to de-risk payroll really cheaply uh, is jump on our um, website and, um, oops, there we go. Uh, and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We provide a, uh, like I say, a free payroll weekly newsletter that'll keep you updated with um, sort of what's going on at Fair Work and a few other things uh, around payroll. Just get on our website, sign up, won't cost you anything. You'll hear from us every Monday morning. Now, what I, I did want to do for, for Reckon clients, because I really, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to you and really appreciate the fact that Reckon recognise that payroll is a really complicated part of, um, of doing business in Australia. So to make sure that you don't make these and other payroll mistakes that cause you both gov governance and compliance risk, 
Um, like I say, current fair work fines are up to $51,000 per breach and 10,000, that's for an organisation, and $10,200 per breach for individuals. Um, we wanted to give uh, Reckon clients 20% off our online and our classroom based training. We do classroom based training in major capital cities in Australia and 20% off our annual membership which is where you have access to our resources and our help desk and uh, all those good things. Um, we have also, a, as part of the membership, you get access to our online members portal which has got a heap of calculators and online resources and best practice guides. We do monthly technical, technical webinars with people far more technical than myself on payroll topics, uh, providing, we also provide legislative updates to our members. Like I say, standard memberships less, less than $2 a day, less than 20%. Um, that's all you need really to keep out of payroll trouble. So to do that, just visit our website, austpayroll.com.au. Um, when you go through the transaction process, just use the discount code RECKON, R-E-C-K-O-N, and uh, you'll get that 20% discount. Plus, uh, everyone that joins the Australian Payroll Association with that code, you'll get a complimentary copy of my book, The Payroll Revolution. We'll stick that in the poster as soon as you join. If you need to get hold of us for any other reason, um, we've got, uh, th there's my personal email address. You can, you can get me on that. You can also get me via the website um, or speak to one of our team on, our, uh, on those numbers. So that's uh, at 10.44, which is quite extraordinary because I can normally talk a glass eye to sleep. Um, that's uh, what we've, uh, that's all I've got for you in terms of content. I think Vicky was going to talk about, uh, see if anyone had some questions and uh, Vicky, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, thank you Tracy. Um, we do have quite a few questions, so we'll just go through each of those. Um, we will try to get through all the questions today. Um, if we don't get them all, we'll make sure email responses are sent out. So I'll just go through a few of them. Okay, so Raphael S, how about a bonus? I think this is from when you started the presentation. How about a bonus for superannuation? I'm guessing so. Superannua yeah. Superannuation, absolutely, 100%, all of the time, attracts, uh, is payable on a bonus. Now, what, how you can get around this is in the paperwork where you give your employees the bonuses, just say that this bonus includes superannuation in the paperwork and then just take out the 9.5% the um, and pay them. So if they're getting a $10,000 bonus, just pay them whatever it is, 9000 and whatever, and pay the balance to their superannuation fund. Okay, thank you. And Annie just asks, what about penalty rates paid for working on a public holiday? For superannuation? Yeah, these are all from yeah. the beginning of the presentation. Yeah. So if, if, if you work, if you get those penalty rates for working on that, on that day, yes, they are payable. It's only, it, it's only um, outside of your ordinary hours. So if, you're, if your um, employees are rostered to work that public holiday and you expect them to work that public holiday, uh, yes, they get paid those. But if they if they get paid, um, I actually I'm just thinking, do they get paid? The question may be, do they get paid a public holiday if they don't work it? I do still think that's ordinary time earnings. I, I might have to get back to you on that one though. Public holiday not worked. I'm just going to write that down. I'll let you know, Vicky, and you can put that in the perhaps the the, the email follow up. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, Kelly just asked, what if it's regular overtime, i.e. two hours overtime every week? If it's part of their, um, their ordinary time earnings, yes, it's payable. So in that case, I would pay. Super. And Judith just asked, if overtime is regularly worked, does this become ordinary time? No only if they are sort of rostered to work it. And in fact, even if they're rostered to work it, you know what, I'm just going to check with my, um, I, again, I'll just check with my technical team. I'll just just put rostered overtime. Like if we, if it's in your roster, we expect you to work it, is, is it OTE? I just don't want to give you an absolute, uh, I, like I say, I've got people who are um, across this in much more detail than me. I'll let Vicky know and she'll send that out on the email just to confirm whether rostered overtime is ordinary time earnings. 
Okay, and uh, Kirsty just asked, can you please confirm if super, if super is payable on work cover not working at the taxation and payroll train recently, it was suggested that work cover not working may be superable. Is this coming in the new work cover laws? It's really, I don't know which state this, that question is from. So um, it really, really depends on your own circumstances and I'd need to know more information to be able to answer that question. But it's generally, if you're, if you're not working it, it's generally not superable. But there may be certain circumstances in that, for that employer. I don't, we don't know what industry they're on, what modern award they're on. There could be something in the modern award that says it, it is payable. So we, we'd need to know that information before we could actually make a decision on whether that, that, those payments attracted super or not. Okay, and Jennifer just asked, what about uniform allowances and laundry allowances? Uh, I think that was they were part of our examples on the, um, the those allowances that are paid uh, unconditionally. If they're paid unconditionally, uh, yes. Um, hang on, there we go. What are we? Slide 19. Uh, we we if they're paid for deductible expenses. So if they are a uniform allowance where we expect them to be a, a it to be a deductible expense, no super is applied. But if it's just a payment just because you know they have to wear a uniform and there's no deductible expense that we expect, um, you'd pay. So, so by and large, when you pay a uniform or dry cleaning allowance, you would expect there to be an associated deductible expense and therefore super doesn't apply. Okay, um, Alan just asked, what's about casual staff and superannuation? Do all their hours count for super payments given they may work more than an eight hour day? As long as they work, they earn more than four hundred and fifty dollars a month. It's uh, you would pay on super, uh, for casuals because it's it's their ordinary hour. It's what that we ordinarily would expect them to work is casual casual hours. Okay. Are there conditions where people under eighteen are paid super? Um, it's up it's up to the employer. So um, yes, there are. I know many employers that do. But there are limits, you know, uh, age limits to super. Uh, the upper age limits recently changed. Um, so some some employers do choose genuinely to to pay super when they don't have to. So you can you can do that. And um, leave loading is not an OTE, but on call loading is. Please clarify. Uh, on call loading. Is OTE if you if you actually get called out and you work, okay? So, and so that is correct. It's it because it's associated with working. Um, it's it's superable. It's it's ordinary time earnings. Yet on on call allowance, where you're on call sitting at home not working, is not. And I think the other one was leave loading. Um, there, as as per the um, that flow chart, if you look at that the flowchart pretty much covers most things, um, and you'll see that if it's related to leave loading, it's never ordinary time earnings. Leave loading is completely different to. Um, okay, do you just ask? Oh. No, no, go on. I was just saying, completely, completely different okay. to penalty rates. Okay, subcontractors working under ABN and invoicing for labour and charges for use of vehicles and tools. Is the vehicle and tools higher charge superable? Oh, we should actually do a whole webinar on contractors. <laughs> um, I'd need more information, but be very, very careful with contractors. Um, the thing I'd be more concerned about with contractors is whether they are actually genuine contractors or not. Um, and if they are genuine contractors, super is not payable. If they're not genuine contractors, super is payable. So it's more to do with are they genuine contractors or not, or are they just someone you've employed and on a contracting arrangement. And con to to be a contractor, there's a there's actually not a hard and fast rule as to what makes up a contractor and what doesn't. Um, we might Vicky go into this in in a future webinar because it is really important. Um, it's to do with things like who takes the financial responsibility for the work, um, whose tools do they use. So if they use their own tools, as this questioner seems likely that they do, 
they're more likely to be a contractor. But you can't say, you know, I'm a graphic design company and I've got someone who comes in as a contractor and uses all my computers. They're most likely not a contractor, even though you pay them as a contractor. And really, really importantly, just because some, an employee comes to you and says, I want you to pay me as a contractor, that does not opt you out of your obligations. So if someone says, I, I want you to pay me as a contractor and they're not a contractor, do not employ them as a contractor, even if they request that they are employed that way. Okay, um, when there is a dispensation from the ATO to split car allowances, oh, that's the one I just said, isn't it? A private import business portions, would the private portion attract super? Uh, no, it's either all going to attract super or none of it's going to attract super. The, the, the ATO, that's just determining how much tax the employee is going to pay. So that's, that, that, that ruling is not to do with super, it's to do with tax. And where do you put the on-call allowances on the payment summary? Uh, in the allowance box with a, with a note, notation on it. Um, I don't have an example of a payment summary on me, uh, but there's, a, there's an allowance box where you, you list the allowances, so that's where you put them. Okay. If a sales rep is paid a car allowance, is it classified as an allowance or in the gross payments as there are both personal and business components? Uh, it, de it depends on how on how you set up the allowance. Um, if you expect the allowance to be fully expended, or if you don't, again, this is one of the things we need to get specific advice based on your uh, your contract with that employee. I'd n actually need to see the contract before I could tell you how it was how it should be treated. Okay, and not very, that's not very helpful, is it? <laughs> Do we include the amount for allowances shown in the allowances section of a payment summary in W1 of our BAS? Uh, I have no idea <laughs> because uh, I'd have to uh, I'd have to ask a bookkeeper or an or, or an accountant. Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to I can take I can find out, um, but I don't know. Sorry, I, I my my expertise finishes at payroll, not BAS. If an employer has neglected to collect enough employee information to establish a default superannuation account for an absent employee, how does the employer meet its SGC obligations and pay the super? Uh, you need to default. Oh, that if they haven't given you enough information to to open a default account, was that the question? If an employer has neglected to collect enough employee information to establish a default superannuation account. And you can't get that information off the employee. This would typically only happen because you'd normally just phone up the employee and say, I need this information uh, to open a default account. But say, oh, I have heard of this happening, for example, when someone starts and they work a week and then you never hear from them again. Um, you literally send a check to the tax office <laughs> and just note. And there, there is, there is a, I don't have it on me, but there is actually somewhere in the tax office that you send um, a check for super for people that you can't contact. Uh, Rebecca just says, I've spoken to Fair Work and they told me that if I paid a higher rate of pay, didn't have to pay leave loading if that increase covered that. Oh my god, that is, okay let me tell you about Fair Work. <laughs> There's a bit of a payroll joke and they say, um, I phoned Fair Work and I got three different answers. And someone else says, "What? You only phone them three times." Um, fair work, God love them. But they, I mean, I'm I'm very I'm quite close to Senator Eric Abetz, our employment minister, and even he has no faith in fair work. So unfortunately, and this is really really frustrating for small business and and large business, um, the fair work uh, help desk just give poor advice. And in fact, um, you know, the current government had a six month. Um, more uh, six months where you could actually, if you relied on, if you did the wrong thing based on reliance on the information you got from Fair Work, you actually um, were had a had an amnesty against prosecution. That's how little faith they have in Fair Work. Now I can't fix that. Unfortunately, it is what it is. That that information is is <laughs> is one hundred percent wrong. If if there is leave loading in your agreement, you pay leave loading. 
um, you cannot opt out of it unless the person's on a separate contract or you'd have to get them off that agreement onto a separate contract. That would be the only way you could do it. And then even then I'd want legal advice on that. And somebody else was related, is it okay to include the, to include the leave loading in the hourly rate by agreement with the employee? I wouldn't do it. Um, I just wouldn't do it because it's wrong. It's, put it this way, if you had to defend that, and even if you said to the Fair Work Ombudsman that we had an agreement, the Fair Work Ombudsman would still say too bad. I, I just, they're, they're so, um, they really are so militant at Fair Work in terms of prosecuting employers, I just wouldn't do anything like that. Um, I'd get legal advice and we've got some great contacts with a, a fantastic law, uh, specialist employment law firm that I can put uh, your clients in contact with Vicky that um, you'd, you'd, want a ver you'd want a separate contract written for that person taking them off the award and onto their own individual contract to cover yourself otherwise it's, I wouldn't do that otherwise. Okay, thank you. And can you set up an individual individual flexibility arrangement and pay a higher single rate to compensate the penalties, providing the employees better off overall? Uh, providing the employees better off overall. I mean, my my initial response is no, you can't. Um, again, you could potentially try and put them on a separate contract, but you would have to prove that the employee, I mean, you'd have to keep track uh, of the, all the hours work. I mean, you, you, basically, my answer is no, but my employment lawyer might be able to write you a contract that could allow you to do that. But in term, without that, no, you can't. Like, you can't just make an arrangement. You can't just say to someone, I'll pay you more and opt out of other obligations. And it's all very well. You might have a really nice employee and no one's going to, make any complaints so you can sort of have this off the record but if you get audited by Fair Work it doesn't matter how nice your employee is they'll find that you're doing the wrong thing and you'll and you'll be fine for it. Okay and Gabby just asked we put our leave loading into the staff's normal hourly rate each hour worked so end up paying super on this is this okay? Um, I don't know about the putting the leave load. I mean, I, I, notwithstanding that, I don't know about the leave loading that you put your packaging in. Um, again, I don't know what industry we're talking about, what awards we're talking about. Um, but supposing that that is acceptable, um, it just means that you're overpaying super, and no one's going to tell you off for overpaying super. It's just that it's, you're paying more than you have to. But if you were to opt out of that, you'd have again, you'd need advice because. And you know, I, I don't give that advice. I've got a technical team that give that advice. But um, you would have to be able to prove somehow that that, that loading, uh, what, that part of the hourly rate was leave loading. I'd want to see that on a pay slip. I'd want to see that separated just to cover yourself. OK. And Jay just asked, can you do the cert for and payroll admin with APA remotely? Absolutely, it's all done remotely. Um, because we have employers all over Australia and you know, we're not in the business of, um, of running around sort of <laughs> doing the Cert 4 in 100 different locations, it's all delivered um, online through TAFE New South Wales. So um, we... She also you know, asked how long does it take and how much does it cost? <laughs> so all the details are on our website. Um, the, the enrolments for, for 12 months. The fastest it's been done is seven weeks, and it's um, it, all the details. I think it's three thousand eight hundred dollars. I think uh, all the details are on our website. Okay, and Vicky just asks: We are a medium-sized building company. We have two building supervisors. We pay them an hourly rate each day. They attend work. They also get paid a supervisor bonus. We do not pay them this bonus when they are on roster day, a public holiday, sick leave, or annual leave. Is this legal? Also, when they leave, is this bonus payable in their redundancy pay? Right. Uh, I can't 
answer that right. I, I need more information and in fact we have um, the lady who runs our help desk, a lady called Maria, she specialises in, in the construction industry and I'd, I'd, the construction industry is one of the most complicated industries in the country and I'm not confident answering that question. I would need to put that to Maria. So if that lady who asked that question wants to email me directly, I'll, I'll put that in front of Maria and she can give you a, because uh, she is a specialist in the construction industry. Okay, thank you. And um, will there be training offered in the NT? Northern Territory? Um, we have quite a few clients in, in Alice Springs and Darwin. Um, we don't currently do classroom-based training, but we do do uh, our functional payroll training. We do deliver online. Like anything, um, you know, if there's enough, if there's demand, if there's, you know, probably more than eight people in a, uh, we, we would we would go anywhere and put training on for, for a minimum of eight people. And we would never do training with more than 12. So if, if you've got eight to 12 people who would like uh, one of my team to come up to the Northern Territory to do training, absolutely we'll do it. Okay, thank you. Um, someone's asked, if, you, if we are reimbursing employee up to $200 for motor vehicle fuel and reimbursements for parking, is it subject to PAYG and super? Uh, if, the, if it's fully expended, so there's, again, there's a slide on, on this. Um, if it's fully expended, it's, I'm just now looking for it so I can refer you to it. Uh, with conditions, sorry, bear with me. So that would be for deductible expenses. Here it is, uh, slide 19. It says motor vehicle for work-related travel. So that would include fuel and the other thing that you talked about. Um, it's, it, it does, it, I, my, it does, you do withhold, um, and, but you don't pay SG. Now, that's assuming it's not a straight reimbursement. Did you say it was a straight reimbursement? If it's an expense reimbursement, you, you pay neither. It just says reimbursement. Reimbursement okay. for parking. Okay, so if it's a reimbursement, absolutely, you know, it's, it's, it's not on retirement earnings, it's not taxable. But if it's an allowance for those things you expect to be expended, it's treated differently. No, so sorry, reimbursement, um, no. It's just um, cash reimbursement. Don't, not ex don't have to pay any tax or anything on that. Okay, and when the employee is casual, do you pay the super on the extra 25% loading or just the base rate? Uh, the extra 25% loading. And, and the base rate, of course. What is OT for casual staff whose hours change each week? Hours are between 9 and 5, Monday to Friday. Um, yeah, anything. For casual staff, it's what they work. But remembering if you've, they've still got to get to $450 a, a month, which is tricky when you run a weekly payroll, um, to be paid super. So under that, you don't have to pay. Over that, casuals, um, yes, you do have to pay. Is super payable when employee salary sacrifices? Oh, gee, that's a whole other thing. We might go through that in the um, in the superannuation webinar. Salary sacrifice is a whole different kettle of fish, um, and that all depends on. I mean, Lee, we, we will go through this in quite a lot of detail. I think in in the super um, webinar, Vicky, it is quite complicated to answer that question. So, can can I take a rain check to that webinar? Of course. Yep, uh, no problem. Barbara just asked, you indicated you can't pay more on opt-out of obligations. Does this also cover lead loading, i.e. we are paying way over award and therefore we're not going to pay lead loading? Um, it, de it depends what award you're on. If your award states you have to pay leave loading, you have to pay leave loading. Um, you could put people on individual contracts and take them off the award, um, but again, you, Depending on, I don't know what industry we're talking about or what state we're talking about, um, you, you'd need to get advice on that based on, you know, we, we just need more information. Okay, Kim, just ask, does termination annual leave payments have to include super? Do, do annual leave on termination? Termination annual leave payments. I'm assuming that means annual leave, uh, annual leave payments that are paid as part, like, uh, as part of a superannuation payment, so accrued leave that's not been taken. Um, that is, now I'm uh, 
now I'm confusing myself. I need to go back. Now everyone will get everyone will get access to this this slide deck, which has got the uh, superannuation. Oops, the hits right in front of me. So I'm just going through it myself. Um, is it right? It's not. Sorry, a bigger pardon. I just had to check that myself. No, you. Uh, any leave um, on termination. If it's if it's leave accrued, if that's the question on termination, it's not ordinary time earnings because you haven't worked it. If it was leave, if it was leave being paid in the month that you were terminated, say you were a monthly pay and you took two weeks leave, and then you came back and you resigned and you terminated. If you worked that leave, yes, you pay super because you worked it in the past, but if it's if it's leave that's accrued that you haven't worked, you don't pay super because it's not ordinary time earnings. Okay, thank you. Can you just like, ask, you. she's a contractor with an eight. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I was just going to say we like to make it as complicated as possible in this country. Okay, she just like, contract. She's a contractor with an ABN registered with GST. Um, how does she properly apply for super and long service elite leave? Uh, well, I mean, who's she working for? Is she working for someone? It doesn't mention. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I need to, I need to know. First of all, if, let's assume that she's working for someone uh, as a contractor. First, it all depends on whether she's a genuine contractor or not. So um, that that's how. But she could just be. I don't. I don't really understand the questions. I haven't got enough information. Sure. Okay. Megan just asked. We're a pl plumbing company, and our plumbers are on call every fourth weekend for emergency jobs. They are paid a higher hourly rate for callouts. Would the payment for the callout jobs be considered OTE? Yes, because they work. Okay, and I think you've covered this one. Do we need to pay superannuation? Oh, sorry, gone. <laughs> Do we need to pay superannuation for public holiday overtime? How about mobile allowances? Um, a mo uh, a oh, any any overtime? No. So it doesn't matter whether it's on public holidays if it's overtime. Remember, your double time and a half on overtime is not overtime. That's penalty. So, but. Uh, any overtime on public holidays, no. And mobile phones, it depends if it's a reimbursement or an allowance. Um, if it's a reimbursement, um, no, you don't pay it. You probably don't pay it either because it's an, if it's an allowance because you'd expect it to be fully expended. But again, we just need a little bit more information on that to be able to tell for sure. Okay. If I pay staff a daily rate regardless of the hours worked, but no more than 11 and a half hours, do I have to pay penalty rates for weekend work? E.g., I am paying them up to $1,000 per day. Uh, I don't. Honestly, I just don't have enough information to. That's. <laughs> it sounds illegal. <laughs> um, I can tell you that. But for me to make a, to be sure, I'd need much more information than that. I need to know what industry we're working in, what the rest of their week looks like. You know, how many days of the week are they working? Um, what, what award they're on? Are they on like a daily overtime or a weekly overtime? You know, a period overtime. There's plenty of things I need to know to be able to answer that correctly. But it does sound like there's a problem with that. Oh, my gut feel is there's a problem with it. Okay. And what if you think you made a mistake earlier in the financial year, i.e., not pay super on bonus? What is the best thing to do? Uh, just back pay it and write. Document it to the employee. It's just come to our attention that we didn't pay your superannuation on bonus. Just want to let you know it's we've sent you know fifty five hundred dollars to MLC today. Make sure you get that documented, so we know what it's okay. for. Christy just asked in regards to travel allowances. If a client is flying staff from GC to Sydney, weekly re return and paying them a fixed rate from the construction industry, is this correct and is super paid on this? Um, it depends what the fixed rate is. Um, 
and it, dep it depends. Is it travel time? Is it work time? Some some organisations have you know they pay for tra they pay travel time just like ordinary time. So again, I'd need to have a look at and particularly in construction, I don't know what what agreements they might have. So very hard for me to um, to be able to answer that without having a look at the actual agreement, which is completely unhelpful. I know I apologise for that, but. Um, I, I just couldn't tell without more information. Okay, Diane just asked, is there a penalty for not entering hours worked on payslip, just an amount paid? No, you don't need you don't need um, hours worked on a payslip, but you do need um, there are there certainly are minimum requirements on a payslip, um, which include the dates of the pay period that that you're paying for. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to have the hours. Like I'm, I'm assuming you mean does it need to say eight till five and you know? Three till twelve, or whatever. You don't need that, but you do need the, the date of the um, the pay period and the date of the payment, among other things. There's quite a few things you must have on a payslip, and also payslips must be delivered to the employer within 24 hours of making the payment. So um, just keep that in mind as well. Okay. Um, if an employee usually only works weekend shifts, would all his pay be treated as ordinary time, including all penalty rates? Yeah, all penalty rates are always ordinary time earnings. Gosh, you've got a lot of questions. <laughs> There's a lot of questions, yes. Um, I'm still unclear on whether travel allowance is superable if the employee does not really travel much. Please can you it clarify? De it depends. We really need more information. It depends if it's ex fully expended or not. It also depends on, remember what I said about there are caps to how far they travel? It's really something I can't answer on a, on a webinar. I need, very, I need much more specific information on your specific um, circumstances to be able to uh, to be able to answer that. Okay. Um, we have paid a recruitment bonus to employees for introducing a new employee to the business, but have not paid super on this business on the um, on this bonus on the basis that it was not for work done. Please clarify. That's a good question. Um, I would say no. I would say that they've done the, the right thing because it's not related to any work time. Um, it's not related to, you know, leave or termination or workers' comp. And at the end of the day, is some work, the, the last question on that OTA decision tree is: is some work being performed? And you could argue that no, an introduction by you know making an introduction is no. So I, I, I would suggest that, that that employer has done the correct thing, and superannuation is not payable on that payment. Okay, are salaried employees who are expected to work out of hours subject to overtime allowances? Oh, it depends on your agreement with them. Um, it just completely depends. I mean, typically by being on a salary, you're expected to work. Uh, the national employment standards talk about 38 hours or reasonable additional hours. So, uh, but you're, you'd need to have an agreement with. If you don't, if you don't have an agreement and they're working reasonable additional hours, then no, no overtime would be payable. No. But yeah, there could be there could be agreements in place I'm not privy to. So, you know, again. This is all very, this is very general advice, not specific advice. Okay. If a pay rate is paid higher than the award, and there are also overtime because the rate is higher than the overtime is being paid at the same rate, is this allowable? So they're paying um, above award rates for ordinary time, and then overtime rates based on the base rate in the award. Is that what we're saying? I think. I think that's what yeah, we're saying. Three uh, I just. I just need to again. I'd need to. Um, I'd need to know which award that they were referring to, and you need to just read back on the the, the award. It's 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 likely that that is acceptable, unless there is something in the award that says it's not. So I'd need to know which award we're talking about, and I'd have to have a look at it. As a small business, how do we know which award, if any, applies? That is a really good question. Um, it's really, really hard, but let me tell you that the um, awards are not based on your industry. 
they are based on what the employee does. So for example, my particular favourite one is their work a couple of years ago did uh, audits on the Victorian brothel industry. Now the reason that this was a problem was because most of their employees were paid on the Sex Workers Award, but their um, in which there is no overtime for night work. However, their receptionist, they also wanted to pay on the same award, so when their receptionist would turn up for work at 6 o'clock at night and work through till whenever they worked through to, um, they just were paid ordinary hours, but really they were actually entitled to overtime because they, weren't on the, they, they shouldn't have been on the Sex Workers Award, they should have been on the Clerical Award because they were receptionists. So the key to finding out what award you're on is based on what the employee does for work, not what industry you're in. So there's only 122 awards, although that's still quite a lot. So um, there is also a, an award finder uh, tool on the Fair Work website. It's actually not all that useful, but it might sort of shortlist it to a few. Um, but again, this is the sort of thing that you, you, you do need advice on uh, if you've got anything. Some, some things are very obvious. I mean, there's a there's a clerical one, there's a plumbing one, there's a, you know, so th there are some that are quite obvious, um, but if it's not obvious, uh, you know, I just suggest that you get advice to make sure that you are paying people on the correct award. Okay, when a staff member covers someone's shift due to illness or holidays, is that OTE or all our employees are permanent part-time? It, oh, honestly, it, it depends. I'd need to know more about that employee and what else they did during that week or that pay period to be able to determine that. But it's, it's likely to be OTE, but I'd, I'd need to know more. Is overtime payable to casuals if working more than 7.6 hours a day? Again, it depends on your award. You need to check your award. All the awards are different. What is deemed but overtime? Likely, yes. It depends on your award. I mean, it, you, you honestly, all, all of the awards are, are different. It's um, Overtime can be paid after 7.6 hours in a day or after 8 hours a day or after 38 hours a week or some awards say over the fortnight anything, anything over 70, um, you know, 76 hours in a fortnight. So it depends on what your overtime provision is in your award. Could be daily, could be weekly, could be period driven. You might have a time in lieu bank. There's all sorts of different combinations that, that it could be. Is there an age, open age limit on super? Yes, uh, 70. If someone earns less than $450 per month but works more in the last week, that brings this above, does super need to be back paid for the month or only paid for that week? No, if they earn over $450 in a month, it's paid for the whole lot. But under $450, you don't have to pay. Just questioning employees under 18 who earn more than $450 per month and have worked, have worked 30 hours in any one week are required to be paid super? Uh, I think that's correct. I just have to, you, see, you read that quite quickly. Um, it's quite clear on the legislation, I just d didn't quite get the question, under 18. Um, I just might, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to get you the super, I'm just making another note just for your email out afterwards, just to clarify the, the under 18, because again, um, I'm just not quite sure on that one, 30 hours a week, let me just check, because there's a couple of combinations of things in there, I just wouldn't want to give you the wrong answer. I'll email you, Vicky, and you could perhaps distribute that, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Um, Sandra just asks, if a casual employee earns $600 gross per week and their tax contribution is $61 per week, does the employer pay the super out of his home pocket or does the employee also contribute out of their net earnings? This question may not be relevant to this discussion. I uh, know it's completely relevant. The employer always pays the super. There's SG at least. The employee can salary sacrifice and that may or may not affect the SG. We'll talk about that in the superannuation webinar. Um, but no, the employee, the, the, the super guarantee is always paid by, paid by the employer, the 9.5%. Um, 
And how do we identify genuine contractors and not genuine contractors? Oh man, that's a, that's a, that's a webinar. <laughs> um, I will go through that. I'm going to make a note. I'll do that in an upcoming webinar. Um, not sure which one, but we'll be able to fit it into one. That, but that's a very good question. Okay, and meal allowance and overnight allowance for a truck driver. Do these have PAYG withholding and super applied to them? Uh, you, can I refer you back to the to the slides on that? I know I had some slides there that had um, meal and, and travel on that. That should be covered in the slides. Okay, and if an employee works six days a week and Saturdays are optional, is this OTE and do they get super on this? Again, sorry, Vicky, I need to know. Industry, I mean, seven days, I mean, again, you know, nursing industry is completely different to retail, completely different to butchery. I mean, I, I'd need to know much more information than that. If an employee's salary sacrifices and the employer still chooses to pay 9.5% super on the gross before salary, salary sacrifice payment, do we have to report the extra super payment? It depends. Uh, there, is, there is a reportable employer superannuation contribution limit, so we'll go through that on the superannuation webinar because, again, that's a, a great question, um, but we're going to have to go through that in the superannuation webinar. Okay, and when you discuss an hourly rate paid over the award rate does not remove your obligations such as penalty rates, does this also include leave accrual obligations when applied to daily or weekly hire employees? Absolutely, you still, it doesn't matter what, how much more you're paying them over the award, you still have to provide for four hours, minimum four, sorry, minimum four weeks annual leave and the personal leave and yeah, you can't opt out of those obligations. Okay, Sharon just asked, I worked for a company um, as a bookkeeper for the last 10 years and invoiced them accordingly at an hourly wage. Am I entitled to superannuation from them? Uh, I, I need to, I'd need to understand more than that, like how, how long you worked there, what, who, what, um, who took the financial responsibility for the, uh, the client and who took responsibility for delivering and timing and who's... Um, whose systems and, and technology that you use, we'll go through that, that contractors versus employees in another webinar. Um, but maybe 10 years contracting, that's an awful long time to be a contractor. Okay, and if an employee earns less than $450 per month, is super payable at a lesser rate, i.e. 3%? No, it's not payable at all. If an employee contract is to work Tuesday to Saturday as their normal working days, is the employee entitled to, pen to penalty rate for Saturday? If, if, the, if it says so in the award, yes. So you are saying that on, on the whole, everyone is entitled to leave loading no matter what their position and wage? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying at all. It's If, it's, if they're entitled to it in their award, they're entitled to it on termination is what I was saying, but no, not everyone is entitled to leave loading. It depends what award you're on. Okay. And we are paying enough to cover all allowances, but don't show them on the pay slip. Is that okay? No, it is not okay. <laughs> that is, uh, no, there's definitely something Fair Work will find you for. Do you pay super on higher duties? Absolutely. Does the employer always need to include the 9.5% in the gross payments before paying it out? I uh, don't really understand the question, but do they have to include it in the gross? Well, no, super is typically paid on top of the gross payments. <coughs> it was only in that bonus situation that I said you could potentially get around that. And that's not specific advice either. That's just general advice. You'd want to get some specific advice on that. Now, Vicky, I've, I've got about three minutes. I don't know how many questions we've got, but um, I actually have uh, an, an, I have lunch with Bob Geldof today. <laughs> so, have nice. Again. So, I do, I do have to get moving. So, I'm, I don't know if, if we've got too many we more. We have a but, few more. 
Okay. But that's fine. What we can do is we can collate all the information in a spreadsheet and we'll get um, a recording of the webinar today, a copy of the slides, all the question and answers. We'll get that, all that information together and we'll get that sent out to everyone who attended the webinar today. That'll be great. Um, I'll, so I'll get those answers to those. Um, I've got three, three questions that I didn't know the answers to that I'll get answers to uh, as well. Okay. Thank you for the presentation today, Tracy. No, no trouble at all. Okay, and thank you all. That concludes our webinar for today. If you'd like to hear more from Tracy, make sure you register for the other upcoming webinars in the payroll series. We will also be holding a breakfast workshop in North Sydney on the 21st of April at our head office. Invitations and details will be sent shortly, so keep an eye out for it. You may also like to subscribe to the REC and blog. If you do so, please go to the reckoncom forward slash blog, where you'll find helpful articles for small businesses, such as payroll, HR advice, and much more. Thank you and have a good day and we'll see you at the next webinar.